True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. There's about five there. Sort yourself out. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because I'm all out now. This thing's cost me a lot of money. The family's also looking at me. So that's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That is the voice of Christopher Panayatu. He's talking to a man who worked for him. He has no idea that he's being recorded. And I'll play more of this audio for you during this episode. But I must say that this is some of the most chilling audio I've ever heard. Because the thing he refers to that's cost him so much money is the vicious murder of his wife Jade. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 76, The Murder of Jade Ings. This episode is sponsored by true crime channel CBS Justice where Season 2 of Killer Cases premieres from Monday the 21st of March. Today's episode features a huge amount of information brought to light in various trial proceedings, and in a similar way, Killer Cases weaves together interviews and gripping courtroom footage to take viewers on an immersive true crime roller coaster ride through some of America's most chilling murder trials. Watch it from Monday to Friday at 8pm, on DSTV Channel 170. A huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Andrea Bridenhan, Marty Kallitz, Nicolene Lawrence and Danae Miller for your support on Patreon, as well as Ilka Zenskaralyi and Jamie Allen for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. If you like discounts, who doesn't? Head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs or Print Crowd for all your printing requirements and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for a 10% discount and support the show at the same time. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use to listen. True Crime South Africa is of course my main podcast baby, but I've also hosted the Devil's Dorp Companion podcast, and in 2022 you could possibly see some more podcasts popping into your feed from me. You can follow my Facebook page to get updates on those new projects. Today's case is quite well known in South Africa. When it happened, the community the victim lived in, as well as the entire country, held their collective breath to see what would come of the mysterious disappearance, and then the senseless murder case. You may be more familiar with this case by Jade's married surname, Panayotu. I have made a conscious choice not to attach that surname to her in this episode, because her parents and sister refer to her by her maiden name, Ings, and, well, I feel like the man who would end up being proven as responsible for her murder lost the privilege of her bearing his name when he chose to take her life. Research resources for this episode come from a variety of media articles, as well as judgments from Safley, Tony Ng's blog, Jaded, and the television documentary Strangers You Know. So let's get into Episode 76, The Murder of Jade Ings. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. 
To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Jade Lynn Ings was born on the 22nd of November 1985 to her parents Michelle and Derek. Photographs of the young family at that time show a couple madly in love with their first child. Michelle Ings would later say that while Jade did the normal naughty stuff you'd expect from a toddler, she was really a very good child. A few years later, the Ings added another daughter to their family when Jade's sister Tony was born. When Tony speaks about her childhood with her sister, there's no doubt that they had a strong bond. She talks about how they would play with the neighborhood kids, spending their days in their Uton Hague home, sometimes arguing, as all siblings do, but for the most part, she says, she looked up to her beautiful and kind big sister. Jade was very clearly a nurturer by nature. She was hugely passionate about animals and regularly volunteered in animal welfare, as well as being active on social media in that space. In fact, several listeners of the show met Jade through her animal welfare work, a passion she shared with her sister, and those people had felt such a deep connection to Jade that they regularly speak of her when this case is discussed on the podcast's social media forums. It would be that nurturing side to Jade that likely also set her career path in teaching. But it would be during her years at university studying toward that profession, that she would meet the person that would change her life forever. Christopher Paniotu was a charming and handsome young man when he met Jade Ings at university. He came from a Greek family who was very well known in the PE community, mostly for his father Costa's various businesses. Costa Paniotu had been born in Greece, but moved to South Africa with his parents when he was 15, where he met his wife Fanula. They would go on to have Chris, as well as two daughters, and build a good life for themselves in the Eastern Cape. Cherise Swanepoel, who grew up with the Ings sisters, and was a very close friend and colleague of Jade's, recalled how when Jade and Chris started dating at university, People told Jade how lucky she was to have a man like Chris in her life. Chris was seemingly always accommodating, and as Tony would later say, he would always make a plan for whatever someone needed. Chris and Jade made a striking couple, and their relationship would continue after they'd both graduated with their respective university degrees. Jade went into teaching, and it was there that she really started to blossom. Colleagues recall her as one of the most hard-working people they'd ever met. She coached hockey at Rubia College, where she and her friend Cherie Swanepoel worked. Photographs of her with her students clearly show how well-loved she was, and children gravitated to her, simply wanting to be in her aura of kindness. Having been born into an entrepreneurial family, it seems that Chris would always be destined to go into business, and he soon opened a nightclub called Infinity, as well as a supermarket outlet. Jade and Chris's relationship was seemingly embraced completely by both the Ings and the Paniotu families. Both Derek and Michelle Ings said that they saw Chris as their son. Derek built a bar area for Chris when he opened his nightclub and didn't charge him a cent for the work. Derek would later say that he did it because he considered Chris as part of his family and he would never charge his child for something like that. As the years passed and no wedding bells seemed to be on the horizon, it would be alleged by a friend of the Paniotu family, who was also a policeman, that Chris's father started to pressure him to marry Jade. The couple had not been living together before they got married, but when Chris proposed to Jade, they decided to move in together. It would also later be alleged that Costa Paniotu was unhappy with this arrangement as well. Possibly, he felt that if Chris was living with Jade, the wedding might be delayed. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes that would only be revealed later.
Chris Paniotu was having an affair with one of his employees, even before he proposed to Jade. It is unknown exactly when date-wise Costa discovered the affair, but there was talk at the supermarket that the father and son co-owned that Chris and a female employee, Chanel Coots, were being very affectionate toward each other, and their relationship did not seem to be a professional one. It is perhaps this discovery that had urged Costa to push Chris to marry Jade, perhaps hoping that the marriage would end the affair, but he would sadly be wrong. During later court testimony, a friend of Coote's would relay her experiences of Chris and Coote's relationship, both before and after Jade and Chris's marriage. Clarushka Cap had been aware of the relationship between Coote's and Chris for some time. Coots often confided in her friend, and Cap admitted to also receiving expensive gifts from Chris during her friend's relationship with him. Some of the gifts Chris would buy the two women included brand name handbags worth at least a thousand rand, watches worth two thousand rand, and GHD hair straighteners, also valued at around two thousand rand. When Chris and Jade had become engaged, They'd moved into a townhouse complex. Cap would later testify, and cell phone records would confirm that both before and after the marriage, her and Coots had visited Chris at the townhouse and slept over there when Jade was either in Kaoting or visiting her parents. Cap also said that Chris had told her that he was concerned about how his relationship with Coots would change after he married Jade. Despite this ongoing affair and Chris's clear hesitation about marrying Jade, they did indeed get married in 2013. Michelle Ings would say that Chris's family had insisted that the ceremony take place in a Greek Orthodox church, according to the family's faith, and Jade had agreed. Photographs from the day show a beaming couple that seem entirely in love and excited to start the rest of their life. There's one particular photograph which is quite haunting. It's the customary shot of the bride and groom's parents with the newly married couple. Everyone in the shot is beaming. But when looking at the photo, with the knowledge we now have, we know that at least for half the people in that photo, secrets are weighing on their shoulders. Perhaps the thing that stands out for me the most is how happy and proud Michelle and Derek Ings look. If you look at photographs of them just two years later, they don't even look like the same people. And that is what this kind of grief does to human beings. Costa Paniotu stands to the far right of the shot. He would likely have been relieved that his son had made what he felt was the right decision by marrying Jade. Surely he would have thought that everything would be okay now. Chris's affair would disappear into the background of their life, and his son could focus on building a life worthy of public consumption, with the beautiful, intelligent woman at his side. Sadly, Costa would be disappointed. Not long after Jade and Chris married, Costa discovered that his son had never ended the extramarital relationship with Chanel Coots. His union with Jade, it seemed, had not even been a blip on the radar of his intentions with his female employee. They simply picked right back up where they'd left off. The family friend and policeman I referred to earlier, whose name is Leon Eckstein, would shed some light on Chris's affair. It would emerge that after Costa's initial suspicions about his son having an affair, and presumably Chris having denied it, the father had approached his old friend Leon to do a a bit of side investigation. Leon reported back to Costa that Chris and Coots were indeed involved in a relationship at the time, and then the relationship had continued after his son's marriage. From Leon Eckstein's perspective, The reason for Chris's preferring Chanel Coots over Jade came down to their personalities. 
Eckstein says that Chris had often expressed that Jade was, in his opinion, stubborn. Chanel, on the other hand, was what Eckstein called submissive, which Chris seemed to prefer in a partner. According to Eckstein, when Costa discovered that his son had not ended the affair with Kutz, he threatened to disown him completely. He began to ignore him and, and avoid him at the supermarket, and told Eckstein that he really wanted nothing to do with him. For Chris's part, Eckstein says that it was his plan to work his father out of the supermarket so that he could run the business on his own. But it's entirely possible that Chris was not the businessman that his father was, and of course, he was supporting not just his own home and family unit with Jade, but he was also financially attempting to woo Chanel Coots. So, from what Eckstein says, there does appear to have been a flow of money from Costa to Chris in some way. The son was not entirely financially self-sufficient from his father, and whether that money was coming directly to him or going to the business to keep it in the black, it seemed that Chris was sufficiently concerned about losing access to his father's money to take action. And no, that action was not to end his affair with Chanel Coots. While all of this is going on, Jade is not doing well emotionally. No one really knew the extent of her difficulties at the time. She did share with a few people that she was quite lonely in her relationship. She told her sister that she was unhappy with Chris working such long hours, and she really just wanted a normal life. To outsiders, it genuinely seemed as though Chris was just working really long hours because he had a goal of buying a bigger house in an upmarket suburb. Jade's personal journals would later become public when portions of them were read out in court. In her writings during 2014, it was very clear that she was unhappy. One entry read, quote, Every time I rip open my ribcage to release the butterflies, people are too busy swatting them away. I needed a hero, so I became one. All I've ever wanted is to be loved fully and completely. I don't know if I can live this life. I don't know how much more I can take. Why does he hide so much from me? And why is it so impossible to communicate with him? I write these words because I no longer have space inside. I may just explode. End quote. If anyone would have liked to have claimed at any stage that Jade was pushing Chris for further financial security, as is so often claimed in the victim blame game in such cases, another of her journal entries would completely dispel that theory. Quote, I want a normal life. A husband that comes home at a normal time, has a normal job, and makes time for his wife and family. Somebody that doesn't hide, lie, or cover up. Always respects and puts his wife first. Can understand and see how having all the money in the world is not as important as building a life with his wife. End quote. Again, we don't know for sure that Jade had any suspicion that Chris was having an affair but she certainly knew that he was not being truthful with her. The emotional toll that the difficulties in her relationship and then marriage had on her would eventually have a physical impact on Jade. Dr. Bruce Duplessis had been the Ings family doctor for 20 years when in May 2014 she told him that she was experiencing symptoms of depression and was finding it very difficult to do even the simplest things. Dr. Duplessis had prescribed Jade with an antidepressant. They decided that they would try and wean her off the medication toward December of 2014, but when she last saw him on the 16th of April 2015, she'd asked him for a new prescription because she didn't feel that she was ready to come off them. Around that same time, Jade confided in her sister that she felt incredibly lonely 
because she and her husband lived virtually separate lives. When she was getting up to go to work, he was coming home from working at the nightclub, and by the time she got home in the evening, he was heading out again. It seems that Jade was doing her best on her end to ease the financial burden so that Chris didn't have to work quite as hard. Her parents would later admit that they had gifted her money to pay off her car, and they'd also given her money to put toward the house they planned to buy in the future. Sadly, neither Jade nor her parents could know that none of this would help. Because while they were trying to fill up one hole, Christopher Paniotu was standing just out of sight, shovel in hand, digging another hole. One that soon they would all fall into. The school at which Jade and her friend Cherise worked was about 30 minutes' drive from where they lived. As a result, rather than wasting petrol and wear and tear on both their vehicles every day, the friends carpooled together. One week, Cherise would drive, and the next it would be Jade's turn. In the week of the 21st of April 2015, it was Cherise's turn to drive. Jade would usually meet her outside her complex gate at their normal meeting time just past 6am each day. On the morning of the 21st of April 2015, Cherise needed to fill up with petrol before collecting Jade. So at 6.20am, she texted her friend to say that she was stopping to fill up with petrol. It was drizzling slightly that morning, so she followed up with a text telling Jade to stay inside and she'd let her know when she was there. Jade texted back to say she would wait in her normal spot outside the front gate. The drizzle didn't bother her. Less than five minutes later, Cherise sent another message to say she was on her way. That message was never read. At 6.33, Cherie Swanepoel pulls up in front of the Stell and Glen townhouse complex. She glances around, but doesn't see her friend anywhere. She sends a message to say that she's there, and it's not read. Then she tries to phone Jade, and Jade does not answer. After a few minutes of confused looking around the front of the townhouse complex, Cherie phones Chris. She knows he'll be home sleeping after his night shift at the club. He sounds confused as to why she's calling, but he lets Cherise in. Together they search the townhouse and find that all of the items Jade would have taken with her to the gate are missing. Her handbag, laptop and phone are not there. Around 7am that morning, Michelle and Derek Ings would get the first inkling that something had gone wrong with their oldest child when Chris called to ask if they'd heard from Jade. They hadn't, and the strange story of her disappearance from the townhouse complex gates was relayed. Tony Ings was home that morning, and she recalled hearing her mother talking to Chris and coming to the realisation that her sister was missing. Very quickly, both women had gotten dressed, collected Derek from work, and headed out to the Stelling Glen complex. The first police officer to arrive on the scene was Detective Sergeant Aldre Kuhn. He was asked to attend the scene of an adult female who disappeared while waiting for her lift outside her complex. When he arrived, he found the Ings family, Cherise, and Chris Paniotu, searching around the complex. At this point, things start to escalate quite quickly. Jade's family, as much as they don't want to, have to acknowledge that Jade is not where she's supposed to be. She's not answering her phone, and there is simply no trace of her anywhere. She has all but disappeared into thin air. With the detective having taken the report, a case number is issued and Jade Ings is listed as a missing person. The missing person resource organisation Pink Ladies is alerted and they create a poster and begin to circulate it on social media. I remember the moment I saw Jade's missing person poster. I was still working in corporate at the time, sitting in my office at my desk, drinking my coffee, 
and saw the poster shared by one of my friends on social media. Then, the articles started to come. And something just didn't feel right. It didn't make sense. I remember telling a co-worker about it, and saying that I thought there had to be more to the story. It seemed an awfully big risk for a common criminal to abduct someone like Jade, who, let's face it, because of the way we consume media, would instantly become a headline. When police discovered that Jade was married into a prominent business family in the area, they considered that perhaps she'd been taken for ransom. Jade's sister, Tony, tells of those first initial hours after Jade's disappearance and how everyone was just running on adrenaline, searching on foot, in cars, not really knowing what they were looking for, but at the same time, desperately needing to do something. She says that Chris was on his phone most of that day. He would occasionally go to the bathroom to blow his nose, and her heart broke for him. In the episode of Strangers You Know, Detective Sergeant Kuhn reported that Chris had at one point told him that Jade's phone had been active in an area called Morningside. The policeman does not say how Chris claimed to have known this, but he had accompanied the seemingly devastated husband out to the area to search for Jade, but nothing came of it. As night began to fall, a more senior police officer came onto the case. Lieutenant Colonel Reynard Swanepoel, nicknamed Kana. Around the same time, information was received that withdrawals had been made from Jade's bank account. When ATM footage was viewed, it was clearly not Jade drawing the money. Streicher Buerta, an employee of Protea Coin, who was in charge of those particular ATMs withdrawals had been made at, was called out that night. They needed to see the footage immediately. He was able to secure a still of a man withdrawing money from the ATM at 7.25 that morning. He distributed the screenshot to the police, and it would find its way into the media. Unfortunately, though, it would later be determined that the timings of the withdrawals given to Buerta had been slightly off, and as a result, he captured an image at the wrong timestamp. The face given to police and the press was not that of anyone linked to Jade's disappearance. This was not Buerta's fault, of course. He could only work on the times he was given. There was no way for him to verify that it was indeed Jade's card being used. Of course, at this point, no one knew that the picture itself was wrong. What they did know, though, was that there was very suspicious activity on her bank account. A total of three and a half thousand rand was withdrawn from Jade's bank account on the day she disappeared. At 7.25 a.m., an unsuccessful attempt was made to withdraw three thousand rand. This was the first sign that it was not Jade using the card. She would have known her own bank limits. Then another two attempts were made which were declined. The person using the card then proceeded to reduce the amounts they were attempting and go to several different ATMs. The transactions on the account stopped at 12.55pm that day. All of these withdrawals were made at ATMs in the Kwanabuchle area, which is an informal settlement about 11 minutes from where Jade lived. Both Jade's family and the police had to acknowledge that she had not disappeared of her own accord. Someone else was involved, and it did not look good. Shortly after the withdrawal information was received, another piece of information came through. Rachel Windvogel lived on a farm near Kwanabuchle. Around 7 a.m. that morning, she'd heard gunshots echoing in a field near her home. She heard a car drive and stop at an area where two crossroads met. She hadn't seen the car, but after she heard the gunshots, she heard it rushing in the direction of Kwanobuchle. Although her interest was piqued at the time, it wasn't until she heard about Jade's kidnapping that she reported what she'd heard 
through a friend who was in the police force. By the time this information filtered through to the investigating officers, it was already dark, but they still attended the scene and started a search. The area was quite dense, and a foot search, even with dogs in the pitch dark, bore no results. The search was called off around 11pm that night. Jade's family spent a sleepless night together at their home, waiting for any news. Chris had been there, and then he told the group he was going to collect an employee of his, Lutando Sioni, who worked as a bouncer at his nightclub, to help search areas that Sioni might know better. He would return to the Ings house later that night, eat a meal that Michelle Ings had prepared, and sleep in the bed that Jade had slept in when she lived with her parents. As the sun rose the next morning, the Ings were already on the go. Tony and Derek, along with a huge group of friends who were all concerned about Jade, went into town to print flyers and distribute them. They needed to feel like they were doing something to help, and they figured the more people who knew about Jade, the better. Michelle Ings stayed at the house. Although she desperately wanted to be out helping, her daughter and husband convinced her that she needed to stay where she would have consistent cell signal in case someone tried to reach out. Although it seemed unlikely at this point, the hope that this was just a kidnap for ransom was still on everyone's mind. The police returned to the bush area where the gunshots had been heard the previous day. Now, by light, foot searches were easier, but the undergrowth was still very dense, so an aircraft was dispatched to circle the area and provide an aerial view. Within just a few minutes of circling, the pilot indicated to those on the ground that he'd spotted something. Tony was handing out flyers when her phone rang. It was Chris calling. He said that the police had found Jade. Her only question to the man was whether or not her sister was okay. Christopher Paniyatu claimed he had no idea. Tony and her then boyfriend, now husband, drove out to the area. There's a photograph of Tony kneeling on the ground just outside the yellow tape with which the scene is cordoned off. And I think it's one of the most heartbreaking photographs I've ever seen. Police were not confirming anything at that point, but the area outside the tape was teeming with media and people who'd come to help with the search. Tony is clearly emotionally bereft and terrified. Her partner stands over her, his hands on her shoulders, as her hands cover her face. Although a detective has yet to arrive to speak with Tony, there is no wail of ambulance sirens. The area where she can only assume her sister has been found, by the tape surrounding it, is quiet, chillingly still. Then her phone pings with a message. It's from a local journalist. She stares at the words on the screen, trying to comprehend what they might mean. My condolences on the loss of your sister. It hits her. Jade is dead, and the media knows. Her mother does not know. What if a journalist phones her too? Back at the Ings' home, Michelle is sitting with a neighbour who's been keeping her company. The neighbour is scrolling through Facebook on her phone when suddenly she lets out a sob. She looks at Michelle, her face a mask of horror. Michelle Ings does not remember much after that moment. Chris is at the scene with Tony too. Chris's ex-brother-in-law would later testify that he'd arrived shortly before the news of the discovery broke. The man had been married to one of Chris's sisters. He says that he'd been helping to find Jade as much as he could since she'd disappeared and when he arrived in Kwanabukle that morning, he met Chris, who was accompanied by his uncle, Dimitri. The news was starting to filter through, 
that the discovery was not a positive one. And the man says that Dimitri was very emotional. He didn't really see much emotion from Chris, though, but he put it down to shock at the time, realizing that everyone reacts differently to trauma. If anyone is listening who knew Jade personally, or who is particularly sensitive to descriptions of injuries, I'm going to be getting into the injuries she sustained at this point. Detective Sergeant Kuhn arrived on the scene soon after getting the news. He found 28-year-old Jade Ings lying on the ground. She was deceased and had been for some time. There was a very clear gunshot wound to her head. Dr. Kevin Faree would conduct the autopsy on Jade Ings. Faree found that Jade had been shot three times. The first shot was likely fired as she was running away. Her back turned to the shooter. The shot entered her back and pierced her left lung. She then turned slightly while running to face the shooter. This was when the second bullet was fired. This bullet severed her spinal cord. Dr. Faree determined that Jade would no longer have had control of her legs at this point. She would have fallen to the ground. Despite the devastating injuries, the pathologist determined that both of these shots could have been survivable if she'd received prompt medical care, but the shooter did not stop there. The third, final, and undeniably fatal shot was fired while the shooter was standing over her. She was shot in the left side of her head and died almost immediately. Two bullets to the body and one to the head is a classic firing pattern for assassins. When the investigating officers saw this, and they also noted that Jade was still wearing all of her jewellery and her expensive watch, they immediately knew that this must have been a hit. Jade was outside her townhouse complex for less than five minutes when she was taken. Then, if witness testimony about the timing of the gunshots was correct, she was killed within less than half an hour of being taken. She had not been sexually assaulted, and there seemed to be absolutely no other explanation for why she would have been kidnapped and killed. If they'd just wanted her ATM card, they could have mugged her and held her at gunpoint right there in the street. With a gun pointed at her, she would very likely have easily given them her PIN number. Taking her and then killing her were very high-risk behaviours, far too high risk for petty criminals looking to score a few thousand rand. As Jade's family and the community reeled at the horror of her murder, detectives were putting their feelers out. An informant's network is an important part of policing, and in this case, it was vital. Informant handlers spread the word in Kwanabukle that the murder was going to bring down some heavy heat on the community, and if anyone knew about someone who'd been scouting for hitmen, they needed to come forward. They would not have to wait long for a name. Lutando Sioni Chris Paneotu's Bouncer The well-built man had made a fatal mistake when he asked far too many people if they would carry out a hit. Police had interviewed Chris soon after Jay disappeared, and then again after her body was discovered. It would later emerge that he'd admitted his affair to them, but of course he denied any involvement in Jade's murder. He might have been a philanderer, he said, but he was no murderer. Chris stayed with the Ings family for a week after Jade's murder. He ate with them. He slept in Jade's old bed. He appeared to mourn with the family, who saw him as a son and brother. He did not distance himself from their pain. He visited his own family during the day, but always returned back to the Ings' home during that week. He was completely immersed in the fallout of his wife's death. 
and what it was doing to her family, who loved her so very much. And now, he was getting nervous. As the day of Jade's memorial dawned, Chris prepared himself to face a crowd of people and deliver a eulogy for the woman he was supposed to have spent the rest of his life with. Back at the police station, though, things were suddenly moving at a rapid pace. The circumstances around Lutando Sioni's arrest, confession and agreement to work with the police would later be questioned, and I'll get into that in the trial portion of this episode. But for now, I'll present the narrative as it was initially presented. When Sioni was brought in and presented with the evidence against him, he folded. He admitted that he'd acted as a middle man between Chris Paniotu and another man in order to arrange the murder of Jade Ings. Police told Sioni that they were sceptical. He could be giving them false information and falsely accusing Chris just to mask the seriousness of his own involvement. Maybe he was the one who'd ordered the murder for his own purposes, they challenged. Sioni told him that he could prove it. He would phone Chris and get him to admit it on the phone. Again, the police were unsure, but let Sioni give it a try. It was the 28th of April. Chris Paniotu was getting ready for his wife's memorial service when his phone rang. He recognised the number and knew that he needed to nip the communication in the bud. He answers, but he's short with Sioni. He tells him that he cannot talk and he'll call him when the memorial is done. He tells Sioni not to call him again until he reaches out. Police are still unsure that if Chris was indeed involved, he's going to admit to anything on the phone. Chris is not a stupid man. Later that day, Jade's memorial service is held. The event is hugely attended and is deeply emotional. Most people that attempt to deliver their memories of Jade struggle to do so, but their sincere love and grief shine through. Then, Chris Paniatu walks up to the microphone and delivers the most beautiful eulogy anyone has heard in a long time. Some of the words are as follows. Quote, Jade is not gone. She is everywhere. Jade resides in the wind like an elemental force. End quote. The audience was dumbstruck. Jade's friend Charisse said that she had no idea he could write so eloquently. Well, that's because he couldn't. And he didn't. Christopher Paniotu googled eulogies. Then he found one that a man called Charles Atkins had delivered and later posted online for his deceased wife, Jennifer. And Chris just replaced all the Jennifers with Jade's. I can't even tell you how revolting I find that. Now I know many people will read poems or pieces of literature that were special to the deceased at funerals, but then they'll say, my deceased loved one loved this poem by insert author's name here, or I read this and I felt it was fitting, so I wanted to share it with you. But no. Chris just took the heartfelt words that another man had taken the time and effort to write for his wife and deleted her name and added in his own wife's name. When this news came to light, it certainly did not look good for Chris. But the most damning evidence would come the day after Jade's memorial service. On the 29th of April, Lutando Sioni spoke with Chris and told him what he seemingly wanted to hear. Sioni told Chris that he wanted to get out of town, to get away from the heat, and he needed to meet Chris to get some money so that he could flee. Chris agreed and arranged a meeting at a local garage. Police rigged Sioni's car with a hidden camera and the sting was set. The audio from that meeting is available on YouTube 
and I've cleaned up the recording as much as possible, and I'll play it for you now. In the recording, Chris is sitting in the front, and Sioni is in the back. I don't know how they managed to arrange that, because it was Sioni's vehicle, but it was fortunate, because as you'll hear, Chris's audio, which is the most important here, is far clearer than Sioni's. I've been living like a rat now. Why? I don't know. Like, my mother called me and they told me, like, police were dead in my house. Yeah? Yeah. So, every, like, everything now is changing now. Every, but see? why the police off to you? That's why I don't know. I think there's an informer somewhere, somehow. You know? Did, did these guys slip? Which one? Your so, friend? Yeah, Caesar. Did they tell anything? No, even them, they are in a, on a run. Oh, is it? Yeah. Because I told them and they must not be here. You know? yeah, that's why they are on your own. Where are they going to? I don't know. They didn't tell me. Because I, I even changed my SIM card. You know? Yeah, but you need to change it again now. Yeah, after this. You need to stop throwing it in Yeah. After this, after this, yeah. you're going to stop. Like, you, you, I'm going to call you in your new number. Huh? This one, okay? What? I'm going to call you in your new number. No, you're not. You just miss call me. Okay, miss call me. Yeah. Don't phone me or SMS me. So what's going on, boss? I don't know, bro. It's just thing. I didn't see that this one like this. Yeah. How much is this? Plus minus five. How much is it? Oh, five. What are you going to know? I'm gonna. I'm going back to Chinese school. I'm worried about my family, you know. Just what's this thing? I didn't know that it's gonna be like this. I thought this was going to be easy, right? Yes, but why, why did they say to you when they fetched you the other day? Yeah. They fetched me and then they asked me questions. Huh? Yeah. What did they ask you? Fucking questions. Huh? Fucking questions. Tell me. Let me say that, boys. Did they ask you if you were involved? Yeah, sort of something like that. So what did you say? Yeah, uh, no, I, I, must, I must stay away there. Those are stupid ones. So where did they take you to? Oh. They did wait, they did. We went to, what do you call this? There, the Yeah. From there, they, they wrote my statement. So, like, they were asking. And then, in my mind, then, eh? Mm. It came, like, you, you told me, you were going to be investigated. Yes. Yeah, so I was ready for that. Yeah. But I was not ready. So why are you running away? Now they keep coming to my house. Did you take your phone anywhere? That no, you, the other phone. Yeah, I destroyed it. Did you? Yeah, you told me to destroy it. Then I destroyed it. Yes. Yeah. And the SIM card and everything. Everything. I'm not using Did you throw it away? Yes. I'm not using Vodafone now, you see. Okay. I'm using this phone. This. So they didn't ask anything about me? No. Or if I'm involved with anything? Yeah, but uh, I have really they asked me. Eh? Huh? Haven't they asked me? Yes, they asked me. But now but now you've been phoning me all day and they're tracing my phone, don't they? So, uh, do you think this is a look to see? Who, who could I call? Because I have no one to call. I, I know, call. okay, but now you must destroy it and I, I have to tell them you phoned me. Otherwise they're going to think I'm involved. Yeah. So, so you need to destroy that phone now. The phone oh. and the and the SIM card, my boy. Both. Yeah. Just, don't trust me now. No, I'm just checking. Yeah, I suppose I don't trust you now because... Just they think that of the police that are coming to me. I'm not sure my life, I didn't say it, but they obviously seeing who I've been phoning. They are taking my phone and my, every number I phone. They've investigated my family too. What are what is it did? Somebody said something. Yeah, because this is like a murder thing. I was not like a robber or something. But that's what I said to you. It became a kidnapping and then a murder instead of just making it a, a robbery outside yes. the house. Yeah, I'm trying to make shit. Like every time I'm thinking about my family, you know. One, I'm thinking about the other, I'm thinking about the, the two little girls, you know. I'm thinking about my gym. They went the to search your house, Sianda. Sianda, say so. You see? But there's nothing there. No, there's nothing. No, if you stop stressing. I'm stressed, but not why. I'm sure I'm not stressed. I'm not safe anymore. Because I have to run away even from Sizzle. For Sizzle, they, 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 I told them also, they say that man was too little. But now they are running away too. Yeah. Yes, but it's because of them. They made it. They made it the way they did. They made it so big. But they've run away, eh? How many of them? I don't. I, I, I is only it, know Caesar. Is it black guys or colored guys? Caesar is a black guy. And others? I don't know. If, 
And I know Caesar, mm -hmm. because I was communicating with Caesar. Mm -hmm. you know? But I don't think Caesar was working alone. Okay, listen to me. I'm going to report that you phone me now. And then they're going to call me. No, but you're going to destroy the phone. So you're going to give it then to my number? Hey? This number? Yes. I have to tell them investigating. If I lie to them, they're going to take me in. So I'm keep telling you. In, in half an hour, I'm going to phone the investigating officer. He was at my yeah. house now. Now, that's why I can't talk to you all the time. And my uncle is all around me. So I'm going to tell him that um, you came to see me, you wanted to borrow money because people took you for questioning for steroids. Yeah. You need to go hide in Jeffries for a while yeah. and keep quiet. So you're going to support my family? Eh? Sandra, they, for Sandra, you know, is younger and then he's still so fresh. And I'm more about the rank for the gym. Well, so what's for yes, yeah. but I can't do anything now. I'm under investigation, so I can't just give over money all the time. So yeah. don't worry, me and Sianda will talk. Yeah. Okay? Are you, you going to hide out that side in Jeffries? Yeah, I'm going to stay while I'm there. Because I guess I'm safe that side. So I'm going to say you're going, you, you must destroy your phone now, eh? Yeah. And the SIM card, and I'm going to say you told me you're going to East London. It's fine. So you stay going to East London? Yes. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be okay as long as they never know about us, Tando. Yeah. I never, ever, I only ever helped you with the gym. I never did anything with you. I'll sort out your family. You hard low, okay? Okay, sure. You need to be gone for a few months till this thing calms down. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask if I need something, I'm going to miss call you. No, not on this number. Not on any number. You're gonna miss call me once, then you're gonna wait until yeah. I get another phone and some part. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Alright? Okay. okay. There's about five there. Sort yourself out. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because just... I'm all out now. This thing's cost me a lot of money. The family's also looking at me. So that's yes. Yeah. Okay. This thing is not it's not a little thing. No, because these boys made it big. I told you to let them do it outside the house and take the bags and the rings, and then they didn't take the watch or anything. They just left everything. They just left everything there. You see, so it looks like a hit now. So they are after me, and that's why I can't meet you just like this in front of people, Tando. Okay. Okay. Don't find and don't SMS me. They're watching yeah. the SMSs because well, you it, said the reason that you uh, SMSs you don't reply, and then me at the other side I'm hiding, and then like I know, but you need to give me time. So from now on, you just give me one missed call on this number first time and never again. Don't ever phone me or SMS me to this number because they are listening to us. Even now? Yeah, well, yes, I put it off. Okay. But you, you say even now. No, but they listen. when you're talking on the phone, they're listening. That's why I have to report this now. Okay. okay. All right, I'm going to say go into East London. Okay, I'm going to take it. Okay. I will briefly say that Lutando Sioni will later deny that he played any role in arranging a hitman for Chris. We'll get into all his explanations. But for me, I don't know how you can have a conversation with a person like the one you just heard if you had no involvement. And from Chris's side, his cold attitude toward what he's discussing here is chilling. He regularly refers to his wife's murder as this thing, complains about how much money it's cost him. At one point, Chris leans into the back seat and searches Sioni for a wire. He's becoming suspicious. And yes, he has good reason to be. One of the most shocking things that's revealed in this recording, for me at least, is when Chris says something to the effect of, I told you they must do it outside the complex and take the laptop and jewellery and stuff. Make it look like a robbery. The intention had been for Jade to be shot while she was waiting for Cherise. So not only was he quite happily arranging the murder of his wife, but he had zero regard for Cherise's life either. If she pulled up as the act was going down, who knows how she might have reacted. She may have tried to intervene and also been killed. And that aside, 
Chris knew very well that if Jade was shot while waiting for her friend to pick her up, Charisse would find her. Charisse would find her friend's dead body on the sidewalk. And Christopher Paniotu had zero problem with that. When the Ings family was allowed to watch the footage, Tony recalls feeling like she was watching a movie. At no point in the preceding week had the thought even entered their minds that Chris had been behind this. And now, here they were, watching the man they love as family for a decade, and he's speaking about the murder of their child and sister, like he's discussing nothing more than a business deal. With the footage in hand and sufficient evidence to point to Chris's involvement, he was arrested soon after. Chris's family was said to be in shock. He claimed his innocence and told them he'd had no involvement in the murder. But his arrest was only the beginning of the investigation. Police still had a lot more work to do, and a few arrests to make. When Lutando Sioni was arrested, he gave police the name of a man who'd eventually agreed to commit the crime. It would emerge that he'd contacted or met with four or five different individuals, including one named Trompi, who will become important later in a different context. Eventually, a man named Sizwe Vumazonke was secured as the hitman. Cell phone communication between all of the parties involved in this crime would be vital evidence. Paniotu only ever communicated with Sioni. Sioni, in turn, after a deal was struck, only communicated with Vumazonke, and Vumazonke would build his own team, which his records would show he'd been in contact with. 31-year-old Sizwe Vumazonke was a career criminal, at the time of Jade's murder, he was out on bail for an armed robbery he was alleged to have committed in December 2013. Before that, in 2011, he'd been convicted of theft and possession of a stolen firearm and ammunition. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but served two and a half. Initially, police were given information by Sioni that Vumazonke had fled to Cape Town after the murder. This information was not entirely untrue, but when news filtered through the grapevine that the police were after him, Vumazonke had allegedly left the Western Cape and returned to the Eastern Cape. It was there, on the 3rd of May 2015, that Sizwe Vumazonke was tracked down and arrested. Jade's family was struggling to come to terms with the fact that her husband may have been involved in her murder. Her mother, Michelle, felt great guilt that she'd taken care of Chris during that period after the murder. Tony felt like she should have paid more attention to Jade's concerns about her relationship. The community around the Ings provided great support. People started wearing Justice for Jade shirts and putting bumper stickers on their cars. As one friend of the family would say, though, when Jade was initially abducted, there was this sense of terror from the community that a woman could not even safely wait for her lift to work. But when Chris was arrested, there was a palpable sense of relief among the community. It seemed people almost felt like, well, at least this one was not random. But really, as this friend of the family explains, there was no reason for relief. If anything, the reality was even more terrifying. Police understood that although the video footage would present good evidence against Chris, they would need to present a strong case against the others in order to convict. At this point, Sioni was pegged to be a Section 204 witness. This means that despite being involved in the crime, he'd agreed to testify for the state in exchange for immunity from prosecution for his own role. This deal with Section 204 witnesses is only sealed after their testimony in a trial. 
if and when they testify in the manner which they agreed to initially, then the deal is finalised. If, however, they change their version or refuse to testify, they are considered hostile witnesses, and the Section 204 determination is revoked. As previously mentioned, cell phone evidence would become vital to tying the various role players together in this crime. Using Vomazonke's cell records, police were able to identify two other individuals involved in the crime. Sitemba Nimembe and Zolani Sebeko had been recruited by Vomazonke to help him commit the murder. Cell records showed that there was never any communication between Paniyotu or Sioni and these two people. All communications came from Vumazonke. As the spider web began to sketch itself out, more details came to light that pointed to how the crime may have been carried out. Zulfa Soknara was working at Zem's car hire on the 9th of March 2015 when an individual entered her place of work asking to hire a vehicle. That individual would later be identified as Vuma Zonke. The man had hired a Toyota Etios from her, presenting an ID document as well as a bank statement for proof of address, and paid three and a half thousand rand in cash. When police interviewed Soknara, she showed them the vehicle which had since been returned and indicated that the vehicle was fitted with a tracking system. By some stroke of luck, this tracking system would prove to be extremely sophisticated and link Vumazonke to many of the pertinent locations in this case. Police seized the vehicle and conducted a forensic examination on it. Despite its having been cleaned, police were able to find blood in the boots of the car. Although it was never confirmed that this blood was Jade's, I think there is quite a high probability that it was. We know that Jade was shot in the field and left there, so this means that she'd been injured in some way, perhaps punched to silence her, and then she'd been put into the boots of the Etios. For Cherise Swanepoel, this tracking device evidence, as well as Vumazonke and his team's cell records, would reveal a terrifying truth about what had been happening in the days before Jade's murder. Vumazonke had been in possession of this vehicle for a full month and a half before Jade's murder, and in that time, he and his team had been scouting and preparing. Lawrence Stoger of CarTrack, to whom the vehicle tracking device belonged, would be responsible for analysing the data. He found that in the days before the crime, the Etios had been in front of both Jade's home and Cherie Swanepoel's home. On many occasions during that time, cell and tracking records for the men matched perfectly with those of Jade and Cherise, meaning that they were following the woman. I cannot even imagine how chilling it must have been for Cherise to know that she was being watched and followed by these people. She would later say that she'd had absolutely no inkling that she was being followed. It would also be revealed that the school at which Jade worked had also been identified as a possible place where she could be killed. Tracking and cell phone records put Vumazonke and his team at the school on several occasions. So these men, in which I include Chris, were quite prepared to execute a beloved teacher in front of her students. The tracking information from the day of the crime was very illuminating. In the early hours of the 21st of April, the Etios had been in front of Jade's complex, and then in front of Charisse's home. On that day, the car circled the Stellan Glen townhouse complex several times before, at 6.26am, it rapidly increased its speed toward the entrance of the complex. The car briefly stood still before accelerating away again. It then drove around for a few minutes, 
before next flagging in a remote area near Kwanabukle. These actions and locations perfectly line up with Sharice's timing reports of that morning. It was in those few minutes, between her getting the last reply from Jade, when at 6.26 the Etios had likely pulled up to the complex, the occupants had alighted, and Jade was abducted. Of course, this information only put the car in these locations. It didn't prove who was in the car. And for that, police would have to rely on cell phone data. Police were able to show that Vumazonke's cell phone had travelled with the Etios on the morning of the murder. He had collected one of his team members, Namembe, and Namembe's cell showed that he stayed with the vehicle and Vumazonke's cell throughout the events of that day. The other accused, Sibeko, had only been collected later in the day after the crime had been committed. The car was returned to the car hire company on the 23rd of April. What is really interesting about this case to me is the amount of investigative work that was done after the arrest of the, at that time, alleged perpetrators. I think sometimes we think that once someone is arrested, the trial will start almost immediately. And yes, perpetrators do have the right to a speedy trial. But I think Jade's murder illustrates perfectly how sometimes the real work starts only after the arrest. With Paniyotu, Vumazonke, Nimembe and Sebeko in custody, police were able to search all of their premises and interview their family members. In Sioni's case, because he'd agreed to be a Section 204 witness, he was taken into protective custody, so he was not in the prison system, but he was being watched by police 24-7, both for his own protection and to ensure he didn't flee. All four accused were denied bail. Paniotu especially was seen as a significant flight risk, because his family was wealthy and he had connections in other countries. In interviewing the family members of the accused, police came upon another vital witness. Zoleka Zekani is Vuma Zonke's aunt. She told police that in the week of the 21st of April 2015, her nephew arrived at her home. She said he was shaking and seemed unwell. He spent some time at her home, and when she went outside to get water from a tap, she found a bag next to the door. She asked Vumazonke about it, and he said it was his. He slung the bag over his shoulder and left. It is also alleged that Vumazonke had gone to a traditional healer in the days after Jade's murder, and told the person he'd committed a murder and needed to be healed from it. Unfortunately, none of this evidence would be admitted in court, and in the end it would not be necessary. In one of the many strange twists in this case that make me at least wonder exactly how much cleanup was going on, Vumazonke was rushed from his prison cell to a hospital on the 7th of September 2016. The man had been found unresponsive in his cell, and fellow inmates said he'd complained of stomach pain. He died in hospital later the same day. Almost immediately, Claims emerged that Vumazonke had been poisoned in an attempt to silence him. These claims would never be proven, and if indeed someone had wanted to silence him, we still do not know who that someone might be. But Jade's family had to now deal with the fact that the man who'd very likely been the trigger man who'd ended Jade's life would never face justice. In October 2016, more than a year after Jade's murder, the trial against Panayotu, Nimembe, and Sibeko got underway. All three men faced similar charges, conspiracy to commit murder, murder, kidnapping, robbery with aggravating circumstances, and unlawful possession of a firearm and ammunition. Panayotu faced an additional charge in defeating the ends of justice in that he'd attempted to destroy evidence. All three men pleaded not guilty to all charges. 
Paniotu had hired the late famed defence attorney Terry Price to defend him, and Nimembe and Sebeko were being represented by Peter Daberman. One of the most important pieces of evidence against Paniotu was always going to be that video footage. But the state was well aware that Price was going to be putting forward that the video was an instance of entrapment and that it should be inadmissible. Of course, this is just what he did. In a trial within a trial, the judge would eventually find that the video footage was admissible, essentially because Chris had not been coerced or lied to in order to get him to say any of the things he said in the video. Sioni had not made any leading statements or said anything that could be construed differently. For the most part, Chris had said what he said of his own accord. Terry Price would later say that as soon as this evidence was admitted, he knew they were in trouble. But despite this early win for the state, Price would soon be presented with a gift of note when Lutando Sioni took the stand. To this point, Sioni had been touted as the nail in the coffin against Paniotu. He was going to testify to his original statement. Paniotu had asked him to find someone to kill his wife. He tried many different criminals before settling on Anvumazonke. But when Sioni took the stand, a very different story came out of his mouth. He now claimed that he'd been assaulted and threatened by police to provide his original statement, and also to meet with Paniotu and provide the recording. He claimed that really, he had no idea what was going on. He didn't know Jade was going to be killed, and he certainly didn't arrange for Vuma Zonke to do it. To explain his communications with the now-deceased alleged trigger man, Sioni said he knew Vuma Zonke from the community, and he'd owed him some money for gym weights he'd purchased from him. Sioni took every single piece of evidence and attempted to explain it away with this new narrative, now claiming that if Paniotu was guilty, he had no knowledge of it, and if Vuma Zonke had killed Jade, he hadn't asked him to. State prosecutor Marius Stander immediately made an application to have Sioni declared a hostile witness and strip him of his Section 204 status. And it was not just Sioni who changed their story. His girlfriend, Babalua Breakfast, also took the stand and completely recanted what she had originally said. In her initial statements, she told police that she knew Paniotu had asked Sioni to find someone to kill Jade. She said that her boyfriend had told her in April that he'd found someone to commit the murder, and that man's name was Sizwe. She initially also told police that after Jade's murder, Sioni had arrived at her home with a bag of cash. He told her that there was 80,000 rand in the bag, and that she should count out the money and split it into 30,000 rand and 50,000 rand. When Babalwa took the stand, though, she denied any knowledge of this. She was immediately charged with perjury and taken into custody. And it's at this point that we need to talk about the money, which would be a big part of the testimony in court. The state had to prove that Paniotu had indeed intended and delivered on paying for the murder of his wife. In Sioni's initial statements, he'd said that on the evening of Jade's murder, Paniotu had collected him and taken him to the supermarket he owned and the nightclub. He then handed him a sports bag which contained 80,000 rand. This was the amount that was supposed to go to Vumazonke, but Sioni had decided to keep 30,000 rand for himself and give Vumazonke only 50,000. To prove that this scenario was indeed the truth, despite Sioni recanting it, the state called several witnesses. The first was an employee of Atlas Security, who presented testimony about the arming and disarming of alarms at the two business premises in question on the night of Jade's murder. John Best of Atlas Security testified that on the night of the 21st of April 2015, 
the supermarket alarm was deactivated at 11.30pm and then rearmed five minutes later. The alarm at the club was disarmed shortly after that and also remained unarmed for five minutes before being rearmed again. Now, this would not be particularly damning because Paniyotu was not the only person with access to those premises. Except every employee with alarm access had their own personal code. And the code used that night belonged to Christopher Paniotu. The times also lined up with the periods during which Sioni had initially said he'd been collecting the money from Paniotu and when the Ings family testified that Paniotu had left their house to collect Sioni, claiming they were going to search for Jade. Chanel Coots did testify in court that she'd been in a relationship with Chris Paniotu. The woman denied having any knowledge of a plot to kill Jade, though. It's emerged during her testimony that Paniotu had paid 17,000 rand toward a vehicle loan she had. Coots claimed that this had not been a gift, but rather her annual bonus, and that Chris had paid it directly to her car finance company. The books for the supermarket, though, showed no bonus paid to Coots, and really, even if this had been the arrangement, she should have paid tax on that bonus. Perhaps the most concerning piece of evidence to be revealed during Coots's cross-examination was about that name I asked you to remember earlier. Remember Trompy? Well, Trompy was one of the many proposed hitmen that had allegedly been approached to kill Jade, and cell phone records showed that Trompy and Chanel Coots's number had been in contact 19 times in September and October 2014. National investigative analyst Theresa Boerter had earlier testified that she'd uncovered these call records during her analysis of various data points. And yes, I said September and October 2014. Jade was eventually killed in April 2015. So for a full six months before that, communications were already happening with the hitman. Now I want to be very clear. There is no evidence that Coots was involved in the planning of Jade's murder, and the fact that there were communications on her phone actually does not mean much. What it does mean is that someone with access to Chanel Coots' phone, who also did not want to perhaps use their own phone, was in communication with Trompies. And in my mind, it's very likely that person was Chris. The reason I say this is that in looking at Trompi's cell records, police also found that a few other people close to Paniotu also showed up as being in contact with the hitman. These were all people who Chris was very close to and spent time with. People who wouldn't think twice if Chris said, Hey, my phone battery's dying. Do you mind if I use your phone real quick? And to be honest with you, I would not put this past Chris Paniotu. The evidence so far has shown that he was cold and calculating. He showed zero concern for the well-being of anyone but himself. So it would really be nothing to him to involve his girlfriend and family members inadvertently in a plot to kill his wife. I don't think there was a huge network of people involved in trying to have Jade murdered. It was Chris. Just Chris, using people the way Chris used people. All of the evidence I've indicated so far was also presented in the trial. The tracking evidence, the ATM withdrawals, the cell data. Although in South Africa we do not need to prove motive, the state was presenting that Chris had wanted Jay dead for two reasons. He wanted his relationship with the more submissive Coots to continue, and financially, he could not afford to A, continue supporting two lifestyles, and B, lose his father's financial input into his businesses. 
to support this, former business partner of Paniotu, was called to testify. Kevin McLaughlin testified that he'd been involved in a business plan with Paniotu in which they planned to set up a string of sports bars and betting businesses across the Eastern Cape. The pair were quite far into this plan, but Paniotu was struggling to get the money together. He needed 750,000 rand to complete the deal. And around the time that we now know Costa was withdrawing support from his son, Paniotu told McLaughlin that he was going to have to put the plan on hold. When the evidence of Jade's emotional turmoil was presented in court, a picture began to emerge of a couple in conflict. Jade desperately trying to cling to her marriage and make things work, but not understanding that she didn't have all the information to do so. Chris on the other side, coming to the realisation that something had to give, but deciding that he was going to deal with the situation in a way that suited him and no one else. A lot has been made of the fact that Chris was allegedly influenced by his parents' ideals. It has been claimed that he felt he could not divorce Jade because his parents were against divorce. But I think that this is simplistic. Sure, the Paniotus would not have been happy with him divorcing her, but it's not like that would have destroyed his relationship with them. After all, one of Chris's sisters had divorced her husband. Really, I think that Chris did not see divorce as an option because he knew that he would have to make financial settlement with Jade, and perhaps also because he didn't want his affair to become public. He didn't want his perfect little image tarnished by an ugly divorce. In 2017, the trial eventually tapered down after the defence lawyers had done their best to combat the mountain of evidence. In handing down his judgment, Judge Dylan Chetty was scathing of Chris Paniotti's actions, saying that he had approached the murder of his wife as nothing more than another business deal. He found Paniotu guilty of murder, but not guilty on the remaining counts. Imembe was found guilty of robbery with aggravating circumstances and murder, but not guilty on the remaining counts. Sibeko was found guilty of conspiracy to murder and not guilty on the remaining counts. As part of the lead up to sentencing, Jade's sister Tony read out a victim impact statement to the court. When she started speaking and noticed that Chris was not looking at her, she called him out, saying, the least you can do is look at me. Chris didn't, though. He continued to stare straight ahead, expressionless as she spoke. This is a portion of Tony's statement. Quote, A year ago, when I decided I was going to request the opportunity to address the accused in court, the letter I had in mind was very different to the one I'll be reading here today. I thought I would stand here, pointing at the three of you, laughing as I tell you all you've lost. But that would be an absolute lie. So I stand here today with a broken heart, a damaged life, and immense anger. You have all won. In fact, you won this selfish game the day you agreed to murder Jade. As usual, Chrissy gets exactly what he wanted. As much as I respect and appreciate the judge's ruling, no sentence will ever be enough, and no sentence will ever put the damaged pieces of our life back together. End quote. She went on to say that she thought her sister's murder would have been the worst thing she'd ever experienced, but she actually felt that the trial was even worse. And a lot of that, she said, had to do with how defence attorney Terry Price and his colleagues had treated her family. Addressing Price directly, she said, quote, From day one, my family and I were treated like the enemy. My family and I were repeatedly disrespected by members of the defence team. Quite honestly, 
I am appalled at your actions and what you have contributed to my family suffering emotionally. We did not ask for this. We did not ask to be here, and we certainly did not deserve this treatment. No victim's family deserves this treatment. I understand that this is your job, but understand this. These are real people's lives that you're dealing with, and it seems you've all forgotten that an innocent person was murdered. End quote. She conceded that the other defense attorney, Mr. Dauberman, had behaved entirely professionally, and she said that he could teach other people a lot about respect. She asked the judge that when he hand down his sentence, he keep in mind that if Bumazonke had not been released from prison when he was, her sister may still be alive. Christopher Paniotu was handed down a life sentence. The member who actively participated in Jade's murder was also given a life sentence. Sibeko was given 15 years in jail. Christopher Paniotu still claimed his innocence at that point, and he would go on to exhaust all of his appeals unsuccessfully. Chris's mother, Fanula, spoke to You magazine, saying, quote, Yes, Jade's family are in pain, but we are in agony. It doesn't matter if others think we didn't love Jade. They are very, very wrong. We also lost a daughter and now we've lost our son. End quote. This case really has so many sidebars that I was constantly amazed and horrified in equal measures as I was researching. In 2019, news broke that Costa Panayotu had been shot and killed outside his business. His assistant, who was with him at the time, was abducted, allegedly raped, and then released in a rural area. Immediately, the police's organized crime unit was put in charge of the investigation, pointing to the likelihood that this was a hit. Chris applied for permission to attend his father's funeral, but this was denied. As at 2022, there seems to have been no arrests made in Costa's murder. Then you're likely asking, well, what about Sioni? He lost his immunity when he changed his story on the stand, so he needed to be prosecuted. Yes, well, about that. When Latanda Sioni walked out of the courtroom after being declared a hostile witness that day, he disappeared. He fled and was on the run for six months before being apprehended. There are many theories about why Sioni changed his story, and who funded his complex six-month escape, but none of these have been proven. In 2021, though, Lutando Sioni did eventually stand trial for his role in the murder of Jade Ings, and this trial brought Chris Paniotu back to court. This time, likely realising he would eventually need to be honest if he ever wanted to get parole, Paniotu actually admitted to arranging the murder of Jade. He was made to look at photographs of her bullet-riddled body, and then said that he was, quote, deeply, deeply sorry for the hurt and pain I caused everybody, end quote. Paniotu said that he was under immense pressure and could not keep up with everything going on in his life, a wife, a mistress, and a demanding job. This, he said, was what had led up to Jade's murder. Jade's family called his admission too little too late, because if Chris had just admitted his involvement right in the beginning, her family would not have had to go through that devastating trial. I have to say that when I was looking at the evidence around Vuma Zonke and his team's actions, I got a really bad feeling that these guys were not doing this for the first time, or the last time for that matter. And this was entirely accurate. Because shortly after Membe was handed down his life sentence for Jade's murder, he had to start a new trial for another murder. 
Three months after Nimembe helped to kill Jade, he and other accomplices also murdered 78-year-old Denise Weber in what appeared to be a targeted home invasion, but I suspect was much more than that. Nimembe was given a life sentence for this murder too. And then I read the accomplices' names, and one surname stood out, Vumazonke. Now, of course, we know sees where Vumazonke is deceased, so it's not him. And this Vumazonke's first name is Tando. A brother, a family member, a very strange coincidence. I would say it's very likely and, honestly, utterly terrifying. The modus operandi in Weber's murder involved renting a car and using it to commit the crime. The home was surveilled for a while before the murder. So how many other murders can be attributed to this network of men? For the most part, although I probably should be, I am no longer shocked when spouses carry out cold-blooded planned murders on one another. As much as we would like to believe that we know another person, no matter how long you've been with them, you only ever know what they choose to share with you. Jade knew that Chris was hiding something, but not in her worst nightmares could she have guessed what was really going on behind the nice guy facade. Jade's murder devastated many people. For many, their lives will never be the same again. Jade's sister Tony says she often feels guilty for being alive. She started a blog she calls Jaded, on which she shares memories of her sister. And while I could come up with my own summation to end this episode about who Jade was and why her death was such an utter tragedy, I don't think that anyone could possibly express it better than her own sister. So it is with Tony Ng's Bridget's words that I will end this episode and pay tribute to Jade. You can read the full text on her blog by googling Jaded. She was an amazing sister. Yes, we bumped heads a lot and had silly arguments when we were growing up. But that doesn't change the fact that she was an amazing sister. I always looked up to her, her feisty character, her ambitious personality, her caring nature for children and animals. Dynamite in a small package, quite literally. She was so hardworking, and while she never expected a pat on the back for a job well done, I always felt like she wasn't truly appreciated enough. Many people didn't acknowledge how hard she worked and how hard she tried. She listened to many sad stories from children at school, and although she never disclosed any information with me, she would always tell me how much it bothered her knowing that there were children that were dealing with so much at home. She was a mentor to them someone that they could confide in, and she took her job very seriously. She carried their hurts and their sadness with her. She had such a big heart. She would always tell me how proud she was of me, even though I was just following my heart and my passion. I'm no professional businesswoman. But that was enough to her. She just understood. We shared the joy and the absolute love of wildlife and animals. Our love was just real and indescribable. You don't realize what you've got until it's gone. This is so true. I always knew my sister was special, but now I realize just how special she was. I will always feel guilty for just being alive. And I really do wish that it was me that was murdered instead of her. I wish my mom and dad still had her rather 
than me. Thank you for listening to episode 76, The Murder of Jade Ings. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen. You can also follow the show on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Bye.